Okay. Oh, there's someone else on Zoom. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, multimodal research tasks. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into the exact modalities you might be using for your research projects, the exact tasks and data sets you might be working with. And more importantly, how do we come up with good research ideas? One of the good research idea in multimodal, that'll probably give you some inspiration for the projects you all would do for this course. Remember, the course project is a very big component uh, for this course. So before you get into that, just a little bit uh, recap about the syllabus. I know LP rushed through a little bit about the syllabus towards the end. Uh, we're also gonna talk about how do you design your experiments? How do you come up with a good research project and design the right experiments to get to those research, to answer those research questions? And I'll give a bit of a historical view of multimodal research. And the core of the, the, the talk will be about uh, various multimodal data sets you might be working with, the exact modalities and what are the research tasks. And finally, we have time. I'm going to cover a little bit about uh, previous course projects. Uh, good examples of good research questions other students have asked in the past. Uh, good examples of experimental design and interesting results they have come up with. So firstly, course syllabus, just to give a very quick recap. Um, there's three big paradigms. Coming to the lectures, filling out the highlight forms, going to be 16% of your grade. Uh, reading assignments. Uh, it's going to be 12% of your grade. And as I mentioned, the bulk of the, the grade will be for the course projects. That's going to be 72%. Uh, so Piazza contains a syllabus with all the details, um, announcements, questions, reading assignments, resources, syllabus, all on Piazza. We also have a course website ready. I've made this last night. Um, it contains a basic framework of the syllabus and also the schedule of lectures. But this is going to be updated slower. This is mo mostly for the audience outside of CMU to follow the class. So the slides and the videos will be recorded quickly on Piazza, but this is going to be a bit slower because we have to edit the videos before we can post them publicly. Okay, so several requirements. You're going to be ready to read papers. There's going to be about six papers, uh, once roughly bi-weekly. The goal is to summarize these papers and engage in discussion with um, other students in the class. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, hopefully you've already taken some machine learning course. You're not really going to go into the in-depth of basics, machine learning, deep learning. We're going to require that, that as you already have the uh, background for that. And the goal is to really come up with a high quality research project. So in terms of grading, let me out of the way. In terms of grading, uh, again, 16% for lectures, 12% for readings, and 72% for the course project, roughly divided into uh, several milestones, the proposal, uh, the first and second midterm assignment, and the final assignment. So firstly, lecture highlights. This is going to start next week. Um, and this is the point. We want all of you to come to class. Uh, if you don't come to class, at least watch the lectures uh, online on that same day. And the goal is to, for every 30 minutes in class, write a couple of sentences describing what you learned from those 30 minutes, and also any questions and answers, the questions you might have for that part of the lecture, just a sh short paragraph. Uh, we're going to take all these questions, we're going to put them on Piazza, and we're going to answer any of the recurring questions students may have about the class. And you have to submit this uh, same day of the lecture. So hopefully you come to the lecture in person, but if not, at least watch the lecture immediately after um, online. And that's going to be every 30 minute segments, 9.30 to 10.30, to 10 to 10.30, and then to 10.50. Okay, so that was the lecture highlight. The other big part of grading is the reading assignments. And again, this is gonna start next week. The goal of the reading assignment is to really read in depth several of the most uh, important papers uh, recently in the field of multimodal machine learning. We're gonna divide the whole class into groups of about nine to 10 students uh, randomly. We're gonna put these groups on Piazza so you can see them. Um, every time there's a reading assignment, there's gonna be about four papers. And the papers, uh, each student should split themselves up roughly two to three students for every paper. Don't all pick the same paper. And we're gonna use the Google Sheet to balance uh, the assignment of students to these papers. Uh, so the first point is to read that paper in depth, the paper that you are assigned to, and write a summary so that you understand the paper and you can also explain the paper to others. Uh, the second point uh, you're gonna get is to discuss the other papers, the other, four, the other three papers that you did not read together with your groupmates. So read each other's summaries, ask some questions, and you're supposed to write follow-up posts, uh, just uh, really digesting these papers in detail. So at least one follow-up post 
for each of the other three papers you did not read. And the goal is by the end of um, that week, all the students would have discussed with each other, read their paper in depth, and also read the other related papers, the other three related papers in that same topic. Uh, some main timelines uh, every week for, for the weeks which we have reading assignments. Uh, Monday, 8 p.m., we're going to release the papers. That's going to be the official start of the assignments. By Wednesday, you would have at least skimmed through the papers, chose the one they're most interested in, use Google Sheet to coordinate with the other students which paper you're going to choose. By Friday, read your paper in depth, write your summary. And over the weekend, by next Monday, uh, look at the other three papers, reading the other summaries from students and writing any follow-up posts, any questions, discussions about the other papers. Again, detailed instructions on Piazza. Uh, we're aware that some students might be busy traveling to conferences, not feeling well. Um, so we're going to give six late submission wildcards um, for lecture highlights or reading assignments. With this wildcard, you can submit, I think, 24 hours late. Um, and for projects, uh, for each of the project milestones, we're also going to give uh, two wildcards for any of the project assignments. So each one gives 24-hour extension, no partial credit, just submit it late, we'll automatically take care of recording how many wildcards we have left. And finally, uh, this lecture is really going to go in depth into uh, what is a good course project and what are the expectations, what are some examples of data sets you might be using. For your data sets, you have these two modalities. It should be multimodal. Um, and usually we suggest at least having natural language and images. These are the modalities that there's been a lot of research, they're relatively easier to visualize. Uh, of course, you're also free to add other modalities like audio, touch, sensing, and so on. <laughs> Team should be in three, four, or five students. Um, and we're going to help you come up with teams. Ideally, these teams should be among students who have a similar area of multimodal research interest. And the goal of the project is really to come up with something new. Right? It doesn't have to get the best performance, doesn't have to be state of the art, but at least ask a new research question that you're passionate about and come up with interesting conclusions about those new research questions. And we're going to talk about how to come up with good research questions in a bit. And of course, the goal for all these projects is to turn it close to a conference paper. Of course, it's going to be a final push if you really want to submit to a conference, but there are several uh, venues where you can submit your final reports. I'm also going to make some amount of GPU resources available. Um, not too much, but at least enough to get people started. And there are several deadlines. Um, the closest one is September 13th. Uh, that's a pre-proposal, just a short form uh, explaining your preference for data sets. So based on the ones that we covered today, your preference for tasks, research areas, and any teammates you might already have in mind. The first project assignment is going to be somewhat of a literature review, coming up to terms of what have the what has the research community done in that area. That's going to be due in about two weeks uh, from that date. And then the second project assignment, you're going to be really digging your hands into at least some of the basic baselines, uh, unimodal baselines that have already been done on that data set. Uh, you should have at least processed your data set and run these baselines. For the midterm assignment, you should have implemented some of the state-of-the-art multimodal models. Uh, seeing what are the main errors, whether these models work perfectly, or what are the errors in which they don't work. And finally, towards the end of the semester, your final project assignment should emphasize the creation and evaluation of some new research ideas. So the expectation is that all teammates contribute equally. We're going to uh, ask every team to create a GitHub, at least roughly look at how many, how much each student is contributing to that GitHub in terms of the code and experiments. Each report should describe how each team may contribute it. And if there's any concerns about um, participation levels, you can bring it up with the TAs and instructors. OK. So again, this is a course schedule. Uh, we're at the first week. Um, we're going to be talking about multimodal data sets. Uh, next week is going to be the project preferences view. At least a good idea of what data sets and tasks you want to work on. Following that, the pre-proposal. So at least doing some literature survey. And then the first assignment, running uh, at least getting a data set working, running some unimodal baselines. And the second assignment would be running some of the multimodal state of the art models, seeing where these models fail. Midterm assignment towards the middle of the semester, um, a report describing at least some investigations into the multimodal state of the art and some proposed ideas. We're going to have a short presentation by every team that week, an oral presentation describing 
their ideas and preliminary experiments. And finally, at the end of the semester, week 15 is when your final report is due. And we're also going to have uh, poster presentations. Uh, we found that poster presentations are a bit more engaging. So every team is going to come up with a poster. Uh, people are going to walk around, discuss with all the different teams, the ideas, and any interesting results they had from the course of the project. Yes. Yes, SCS is free poster printing. Yeah. We're going to give instructions uh, closer to the deadline, but it's going to be free poster printing. OK, so we've talked a lot about the course project. Now, how do we come up with a good research idea? I mean, a lot of you probably are wondering that. Um, and in fact, there's a well-established method for coming up with good research ideas. All of us in CS, you might have forgotten, because we're in AI, we typically go with a hands-on approach, you just try a bunch of things. But from the social sciences and the physical sciences, there's a well-established framework for coming up with the research ideas. Um, usually, you start with some initial observations and ideas about the world. You might do literature review to see what other people have done within the space. You're going to ask a research question and more importantly, come up with a hypothesis for whether that research question may be true or may not be true and some reason for that. Then you're going to test it with experiments to verify the research question hypothesis, analyze the data that came out from running these experiments and report your conclusions. And of course, you're going to probably reiterate again and again. That's how the scientific method works, right? So typically in CS and AI, we don't follow this strictly. We usually start here, right? We have some basic idea and we start testing experiments. We see what works. If it works, we publish it. If it doesn't work, we don't publish it. Um, and in fact, lots of AI, in fact, 90% of AI are ideas that don't work and yet you don't publish it. Uh, and typically that is not how the scientific method works. In fact, uh, you have a hypothesis, you test the experiment, you come up with your data. If it verifies the hypothesis, you publish it and you explain why. If it doesn't verify your hypothesis, you should also publish it and explain why. That is what contributes to science. So that's why in the course projects, we're not looking for state-of-the-art results. We don't want uh, all of you to get state-of-the-art results and just, oh, it works. If it works, we want to know why. We want you to figure out why. If it doesn't work, we also want you to figure out why. That's going to be what you're uh, going to be graded on for these, for these uh, course projects. So how do we get research ideas? There's two general ways of doing it. Uh, one is a more bottom-up way. One is a more top-down way. So in some sense, a bottom-up discovery, you would typically start with uh, some data you've already collected, some models that already exist. You're going to try it out, see where the models fail. And from then on, you're going to come up with ideas for improving these models. These are bottom-up because they're more data-driven, they're more real-world experimentation-driven. These are good. This is usually a more safe step for coming up with research ideas because you know all these data sets, you know all these models, none of them are going to be 100%. You're always going to be quite far off from state of, uh, from perfect accuracy or human performance. So there's always some amount of progress to be made by analyzing the errors made by these models and trying to fix these errors, come up with research ideas that way. Uh, but of course, the downside of this is that um, this research tends to be a little bit more incremental. You typically starting with questions that have already been asked, Data sets that have already been created, models already exist, and you're trying to improve them. So it's less risky, uh, but less impactful, a bit more incremental. And the goal for the midterm report is to do something like this. It's not that we want, to, we want you to do incremental work, but we want you to touch both sides. Try out the bottom up side of things, come up with research ideas that way. Um, for the final report, come up with new ideas. You can do it the other way, which we're going to talk about later. But if the other way doesn't work, you at least have something to fall back on. You at least have some bottom-up idea to fall back on. You know you're going to be able to come up with something and try to improve performance based on the errors of current models. So in contrast to the bottom-up way, it's a top-down way. Uh, the top-down way typically doesn't start with data, doesn't start with experiments. It starts with a high-level hypothesis. You're hypothesizing that, for example, this other modality might help in this task. You're hypothesizing that these models are not robust and you're going to come with a way to deal with them. So these tends to favor bigger ideas, uh, but the issue is that it may be disconnected. You're not really sure whether this idea is true uh, versus the bottom-up way. If you found an error in the model, the error does exist and you can fix it. For these, you're, tr you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of imagining, you're kind of thinking of bigger ideas, uh, but they may be a little bit more disconnected. And uh, by definition, they're going to be a bit more risky to come up with. So the goal of the, the, the course is to try both. Right? Uh, the midterm report, we're encouraging you to implement the state-of-the-art figure out why they fail. That encourages more bottom-up discovery. 
to fix these errors and try to come up with ideas to improve performance. Uh, but for the final report, uh, depending on what you do from the midterm to the final report, you can continue on the bottom up side or you can try to come up with new directions from the top down idea. Okay, and for the top down design, uh, the TAs are here to help. So we're gonna have a couple of project brainstorming sessions uh, with the TAs. Of course, you should be doing it all the time with your teammates, but also with the TAs. And I believe after the project assignments have been made, this, the groups have been finalized, LP and I are also gonna meet with all of the groups, uh, about 15, 20 minutes for all of the groups. We're gonna help you think about some top down ideas. If you have any wild ideas you wanna try that you wanna hypothesize, we're gonna be there to help you think of them and also uh, run through whether they might, they may or may not work. Okay, and of course, none of the bottom-up and top-down ideas will be possible if you don't have a very thorough literature review. You need to figure out what has been done, what other ideas exist, whether other people have tried them. So that's always going to be a core foundation for the first assignment. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about scientific research questions and coming up with hypotheses. So research questions are typically questions you ask regarding something that a community doesn't know yet. And typically these questions are easier if you pose them as yes, no questions than how to questions, right? Is it true that these class of models um, do not leverage this other modality in this particular scenario? And then you can have an experiment verifying whether that statement is true or an experiment verifying whether that statement is false. These hypotheses should be falsifiable. And in both cases, if it works, if it's true, the hypothesis, you should be able to answer why. And if it's falsifiable, you should also be able to answer why. So here are some cool examples. Um, typically, you don't read a lot of research papers, especially ML AI nowadays, that are very explicit with a research question and very explicit with a hypothesis. But here are two good examples. I think uh, this paper from Cotero et al. Are all languages easily uh, equally hard to language model? So that is a research question. Uh, you, there is a way to falsify it and also a way to verify that it's true. It's a yes, no question. And of course, the authors ask this question because they have some initial hypothesis biasing them towards whether this may be true or false. In this case, probably no, they're not equally hard to language model. For example, it's going to depend on the crude cross-linguistic compatibility. It is unlikely that all languages are equally easy or that our methods are going to be equally good across all languages. So this is a research question that is falsifiable. It's a yes, no no question, you can run experiments to, to either verify it or disprove it, and that's what the experiments are about. And at the same time, the authors come up with a hypothesis, um, first of all, whether it's true or not true, and also a reason why they think it's gonna be true or not true. So again, you can verify these hypotheses using your, your experiments. Likewise, this paper by Reddy et al., what makes a particular podcast broadly engaging? Again, they had a particular hypothesis. This is not so much a yes, no question, but rather, um, a list, right? Whether things they can discover, they actually make these podcasts engaging. So for example, reducing filler words and disfluencies or incorporating emotion and so on. So again, for each of these three, they've come up with hypothesis for what makes a podcast interesting. And you can then run experiments to falsify, either verify or falsify each of these hypotheses. And of course, you can read a lot of CS and AI papers. Most of them don't come up with something like this. They just say, this model is good, it gets state of the art. They're not really asking any research question or hypothesis. Um, but again, the goal, the goal is to, in the course project, is to practice how to come up with good research questions and come up with good hypothesis and come up with good experimental design to verify them. So those are more um, yes, no questions. There are also more exploratory research questions. Uh, these questions might be more open-ended. Uh, but again, this is, comes with the same idea as a top-down design. We are exploring a completely new field. Um, for this, talk to the TAs, talk to the instructors for, for more tips into coming up with exploratory research questions. Beware of uh, research questions like, does X make Y better? Right? Does cross-attention uh, cross or transformers improve performance on this data set? Um, typically, the answer is going to be yes. Um, but the, again, the issue is that if the answer is yes, you don't know why. If the answer is no, you also don't know why. Instead, how you should answer, how you should ask these questions is, you know, is capturing cross-modal alignment, 
or if the alignment between modality is really necessary in this particular data set. So then you can falsify, you can analyze your data, you can visualize your data to actually see whether the cross-modal alignment is useful in this data set or not useful in this data set. Phrase it in that way, instead of phrasing whether the multimodal transformers will improve performance. So, so usually you have an intuition about why some particular model or some particular class of models is going to make something better. So phrase your research questions about the intuition, the underlying concept. So you can actually verify whether their underlying intuition or concept was true in your hypothesis. And of course, state-of-the-art performance is not a research idea. It is not a research question. It's not a hypothesis. Uh, we're not looking for that in class. Um, ask questions that are deeper, that require more insight. So here's just a non-exhaustive list of examples. Can we, for example, better understand either theoretically or empirically and even quantify, visualize the interactions that different models learn. Right? LP talked about interactions as one of the three key principles in multimodal research, uh, whether, for example, one modality and two modalities contain overlapping, redundant information, or if one of them has unique information not present in the others, or if there's emergence of new information. How can we come up with you know, mathematical measures or visualization methods to quantify what cross-modal interactions exist in our data or are learned by multimodal models? And it's a big open-ended question. How can we better understand compositionality and reasoning? Right now, uh, we all know that ML models are good at percep perception level, figuring out there is a car, is a truck, but if there's a lot of objects and you need a com complex combination of these objects, these models quickly start to fail, right? So that's gonna be more in the reasoning challenge. Can we improve the model's compositionality or come up with better benchmarks to evaluate how good models currently are at in compositionality. Uh, are models robust to missing and noisy modalities? They always work well when all modalities are present. You know, how, to what extent do they, do they start worsening in performance when there's noisy missing modalities or even adversarial attacks on different modalities? Again, models are there and perfect, but if certain modalities contain social biases, for example, biases against race, gender, how does this propagate through the multimodal model? How do different social biases and different modalities combine or maybe reduce each other? Can we make models more interpretable, uh, more trustworthy, more easily debuggable by humans? Can we make them faster and more efficient? And the cool thing is all of these questions, you can ask them on existing data sets, on your classic VQA image capturing data sets. We're gonna be talking about all these classic data sets. You can study all of these questions in the context of existing models, like pre-trained models, you know, multimodal transformers, GPT-4 and so on. But just with a little tweak on either the mathematical or the experimental side, you can already start answering or studying these research questions. Okay? So we don't need to look for state-of-the-art performance. We want you to ask an interesting question, something that has not really been explored in the community and come up with interesting answers. Uh, both positive results and explanations for why, or negative results and explanations for why. Theoretical projects are welcome too. Um, it can be pure theory, pure math, but at least some synthetic or small scale data set to verify your theory. And of course, the goal is to, um, this, you can either come up with solutions to existing research questions, or you can come up with new research questions completely. Um, defining new research questions is, of course, better, but it's also a bit more risky. You need to make sure that the community eventually catches on to this research question. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions about uh, coming up with research ideas, what is expected from the project, and, and so on? Any questions? Okay, great. Um, so the TAs, the instructors, LP and I are all available. Um, the first thing is still to come up with, come up with uh, choose a particular data set, form groups, and we're gonna help you out in creating these research ideas. Uh, we're gonna meet with all of you, make sure that the research ideas are on the right track. So don't worry too much about this, or don't be too stressed out about it right now. Okay, so multimodal research. Uh, time to get into some of the details about multimodal data sets, what tasks people are looking at. So we need to start with a historical view first. A lot of people might think that multimodal research started in 2020 uh, with GPT-4. Of course, that's not true. 
multimodal research started all the way back in the 1970s. And there were four eras of multimodal research, the behavioral era, the computational era, the interaction era, and nowadays the deep learning era. Of course, we're going to focus a little bit more about our deep learning era since 2010s with your big GPUs, LSTMs, and CNNs. But a lot of the modern multimodal data sets and models and tasks are very much inspired by the previous uh, four eras. So some examples of each era. In the behavioral era, uh, multimodal research arguably started with a study of human behaviors, human speech and gestures. And there's one reference that I like and LP likes very much, it is this researcher, this psychologist called David McNeil back at the University of Chicago. So before David McNeil, everyone thought that speech, you know, just the way that we say things was a primary mode of communication. And your gestures, such as your, 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 your lips, your face, your hands, they're just a byproduct. You know, it could be there, it couldn't be there, but speech was the most important. And as a result, everyone uh, built models for speech recognition based only on audio, based only on what you hear people say. But David McNeil came in and thought and hypothesized that gesture is not just a byproduct. Gesture is a very important component of how humans speak. It is particularly essential to understand human gestures in order to understand what they are saying. And he came up with this very fun experiment. I'm going to play two audio clips and I want you to tell me the difference. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, that was the first audio clip. This is the second audio clip. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, can anyone tell me the difference? Anything interesting? Yeah, and the cool thing is that, well, they're the exact same audio clip. Right. You would close your eyes, and typically some of you are always on your laptops or working somewhere and not looking. So you close your eyes, don't look at the screen, don't look at a person's face, and you just listen to both audio clips. It's actually the exact same audio clip. It is only looking at the person's lips that you can disambiguate whether a person is saying ba, ba, ba with a B or ba, ba, ba with an F, right? And then I'll be talking a little bit about this and answering the question about, about emergence on Tuesday. I don't know. Of course, having a video clip really helps. But ever since then, people realized that um, audiovisual speech recognition is cool. You need to recognize human speech based not only on what they say, but sometimes also the way that they say it, their gestures, their facial gestures, contextualize what they're actually saying. So this is known as the McGurk effect. Uh, it really surprised a lot of psychologists. This was basically a human study. There's no AI here yet. This was just giving these to humans and seeing how they recognize speech. But very soon, this inspired a computational era. We realize that humans process speech from both visual and audio inputs. Can we therefore build machine learning models to also recognize speech based on audio visual inputs? So that kickstarted the computational era. And of course, the example that I showed you with ba and fa was technically the interaction was emergence, right? You don't have it in video only, you don't have it in audio only, but when you combine them, you get something different. But that, that doesn't happen all the time. Most of the time, the interaction is still redundant, right? The fact that what you're saying in the speech and what you're saying, saying from your gestures reinforce each other. They contain the same information. And the people found that not only was um, this emergence useful, this ba, 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 fa, fa, fa case useful, even the redundant case was very useful. It was important to integrate audio and visual even when they were giving the same information. Why? Because it helps with handling noise and robustness, right? If I'm not speaking clearly, you can look at my lips to see what I'm saying. If my lips are not very informative, you can listen to what I'm saying in the audio modality. So you see here uh, this graph, audio only in blue and red was uh, audio visual. Uh, and lower is better because this is word error rate in, in uh, deciphering what the people were saying. This really improved performance having both audio and video modalities. So that was a, one of the main key experiments that kickstarted the computational era of multimodal. Uh, back then people were doing this using hidden Markov models, just, just in case people are curious. And soon after, you people started building multimodal interfaces. Uh, you, you were able to recognize audio and speech from, from humans. Uh, what else can you also recognize? Uh, what are other ways that you can interact and understand humans? And effective computing rose as a very big research area. Can we build computers to understand human emotions, whether I'm feeling happy, whether I'm feeling sad, based on what I say, based on my gestures, based on 
how I say things, whether I'm crying or laughing and so on. A big area of research in effective computing. And who's soon after multimedia, right? Uh, can we go to really digitize, index all the different modalities on the internet? And nowadays with YouTube, it sounds trivial. With uh, these big search engines, it sounds trivial. But back then before YouTube, even there were just a few audio clips, video clips, and text on the internet, can we come up with an indexing system that allows us to retrieve um, and generate more speech and text and videos? It's a lot of research in multimedia in this computational era as well. And soon after the computation era, which was usually one person and a one computer, uh, it went to the interaction era. Can we do multi-step interaction? Can you talk to humans for extended duration of time? Can you model two humans speaking to each other over many, many steps? And there's some very interesting projects. Um, Siri, for example, was actually a spin-off from one of the early multimodal projects in the interaction era, this project called Kahlo. Uh, that was the goal was to build an assistant that is able to recognize human speech, human gestures, human language, spoken language, to help humans in assisting uh, to assist humans in organizing their, their stuff. So Siri was a spinoff and also other research areas in um, you know, collecting meetings, meetings between humans, studying how humans interact with each other in meetings through different multimodal behaviors, uh, studying how humans process different social signals, which are again, multimodal in nature. And of course, nowadays we know the deep learning era. Uh, this is an era which has really brought much better performance in terms of multimodal models. In fact, one of the key papers, one of the very early papers in multimodal deep learning was called literally that, multimodal deep learning. And does anybody want to give a guess on what data set or what experiment they conducted in this first multimodal deep learning paper? Is an example that we've talked about just a couple of minutes before. Exactly, audiovisual speech recognition. This very first multimodal deep learning paper really revisited the past, right? Back to the behavioral era. They ran their first set of experiments on speaking, audio, and visual speech recognition and show that this improved performance much more than the earlier generation of audiovisual HMMs and you know, SVMs and so on. And this was done using um, you know, autoencoder type of model. And soon after uh, this other paper, some of you might be familiar with as well, uh, show and tell, or afterwards show a tenant tell, uh, the first deep learning model for image captioning. And of course, when you build a model that is able to take in images and generate pretty coherent captions that caught a lot of attention in the community. So audiovisual speech recognition and image captioning were some of the first success cases of multimodal deep learning. Now, of course, there were some key enablers for multimodal research in this deep learning era. We had much larger multimodal data sets. We had much faster GPUs, uh, but those typically accelerated all areas. Right. What was more specific to the multimodal era was the idea that you could take images, which are very high dimensional, very noisy, lots of you know, low level features, and really come up with high level descriptors, right? lower dimensional compact embeddings that contain semantic information about these images. Uh, for linguistic, for text, you could take lots of text, again, high dimensional distributed. Before then, people were doing bigrams, trigrams, really hard to process. And you could bring them using things like word to vec uh, into, again, semantic embeddings, low dimensional semantic embeddings um, that respect semantic similarity and contain all the semantic information. And if you have these semantic image features and you have these semantic language features, they are much more homogenous. They're much more homogenous space. And then you can start uh, translating between them, fusing them in the case of audiovisual speech recognition, translating between them in the case of image captioning. And that was really what enabled us uh, to do multimodal research much easier. And nowadays, you see that many of today's models also work from taking high dimensional data, very different, heterogeneous in nature, and bring them into semantic spaces that are much more homogeneous in nature, where it's easier to process them. So those are some of the key enablers in deep learning research, uh, multimodal deep learning research. Just an overview, um, four eras, the behavioral era, the computational era, the interaction era, and the deep learning era. Uh, started with audiovisual speech recognition. We saw that classic example of the McGurk effect. Very soon, uh, lots of research in the computational era for multimedia, video retrieval, video recognition, uh, effective computing, affecting motion recognition and sentiment analysis. And one of the key big applications in deep learning was image captioning. 
And soon after people did image capturing, naturally people extended it to video capturing. Uh, but these are still difficult, right? These are generation tasks are by definition really difficult to evaluate. Uh, I don't know if people have worked on machine translation before, you probably know that generating text is something that's very hard to evaluate. You can use things like blue, roach, compare your bigrams, trigrams, and whether they're in the right place, or you can use human evaluation, but none of these are perfect. And they don't, human evaluation and automatic metrics typically don't, uh, don't give the same ranking to your models. And soon after came a different paradigm for evaluation. If I want to understand uh, using language, what is in my image, I can ask my model to caption the image, tell me everything that's in it. What I can also do is I can ask targeted questions about that image. I can ask how many people are in the room? You know, who is speaking? What's the, what's the color of the shirt of the person who's speaking? So that gave it a new paradigm for visual question answering for image text understanding. And this really caught on because it was so much easier to evaluate. Right? Typically these answers are just yes, no answers or numerical answers or multiple choice answers. Now we had a good metric uh, for evaluating the success of our image and text models as compared to image captioning. Of course, it comes to the shortcomings as well. Uh, there can be biases in these data sets. These typically only ask something very localized. And in other cases, you may still want your model to generate an entire caption or paragraph. But both of these paradigms were important. And after image-based visual question answering came video question answering, uh, referring expressions that really st start going more fine-grained into very detailed parts of the image. Like for example, you know, how many um, empty seats are there next to the person in the third row? You need to do quite a few steps of reasoning to answer those questions. And soon after came multimodal dialogue, um, large scale with the birth of YouTube, lots of data sets based on YouTube videos. Uh, nowadays with the rise in deep reinforcement learning plus multimodal came lots of work in uh, language, vision, plus navigation, plus taking actions, not just making a prediction, of course, you have things in the real world like multimodal self-driving and many more, including today, you have you know, image, text generation, and so on. So these are the glimpse of the multimodal research tasks. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these tasks in a bit more depth, uh, because these are probably the tasks that you're gonna be working on in your course projects. Uh, some of the key data sets within each of these are probably the ones you're gonna be actually processing and trying out your models. So we've come up with a categorization of seven big tasks. <laughs> seven big tasks. The first one, affect recognition. Uh, I really kind of explain what that is. Recognizing emotions, personality, sentiments from different ways of speaking and language and gestures. Media description, that is image and video captioning. Uh, the other paradigm of instead of generation is the question answering. So multimodal QA is a third big category. Image, video, QA, when things with more reasoning, more multi-step reasoning. Navigation, we have to take actions. Um, dialogue, dialogue in text, but grounded in images. Uh, event recognition, so parsing videos, parsing uh, sounds to recognize activities and segmenting these activities. And finally, retrieval, anything that involves translating and retrieving from one modality to the other will fall under retrieval. So these are the seven big buckets, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the TAs over, uh, over the duration of the past couple of years have come up with a very long list of data sets uh, in each category. So A1 to A24 are all of the data sets, uh, reasonably popular multimodal data sets that are publicly available and has some research in it for effective computing. Uh, we've also color coded one, two, and three. One are data sets that are good. There are key references that probably people have done a lot of methods on, but it's not really a good fit for your course project because just because of the volume of research that already exists on these data sets, it's gonna be hard to come up with new ideas or new things to do on those data sets. Uh, two are typically projects that are reasonable, that has been less researched, but also not as popular. And three is a good balance of relatively new data sets with new research questions, and also that rising in popularity, but people haven't completely done everything there is to do on those data sets. Uh, so lots of data sets. So, so usually look at the threes, but uh, maybe also look at the references for ones and twos to look for previous, previous state of the art and baselines. So now I'm going to touch upon all of these, but this is typically for your reference. Um, 
by by the by the pre-proposal, you would have at least selected one area. So let's say you've selected multimodal QA. That's your big task, big area of research, and you at least have some preference for which particular data sets. And choosing these data sets also entails choosing the particular questions. Like for example, some of this requires more reasoning, compositional reasoning. Some of them are more about studying social biases, different cultural biases, different ways people ask questions in different, different cultures. Uh, some of them are gonna be more image-based, video-based, table-based, and so on. So at least have an idea of which category and which rough data sets in the cluster of research questions you wanna answer for the pre-proposal. Okay. Yes, and for dialogue, event understanding and retrieval as well. And let us know, let us know uh, via Piazza if you have some other data sets you think are interesting that you might already be working on and will be a good resource for this course moving forward. Any questions so far? Any questions about some of these, uh, at a high level, some of these multimodal data sets and research directions? No? Okay, good. Okay, and out of all of these data sets, uh, we've come up with uh, even more, more, more curated lists, uh, which we believe are ones that are good to work on. Uh, so the list of these 10 data sets. These are typically ones that we have filtered out even more that they're probably pretty available. They're pretty popular. And we, there is still quite a large gap from the current state of the art. So some of these data sets are, I'm gonna give some, uh, some examples. So firstly, affect recognition. In affect, I can't talk about affect recognition without talking about some of these AVEC challenges. That's audio, visual, emotion recognition challenges. And these are some of the most standard data sets in the field. But because they're so standard and because they've been around for so long, uh, we typically don't recommend you to, to, to work too much on them, but it's also okay if you work on them. Uh, but just be aware that you know, some of these data sets have existed since 2010s. They're a bit smaller. A lot of people have really pushed the state of the art on these data sets, but definitely look at these papers if you want um, to know more about the field. Right? These challenge papers are one of the best written in the field, and some of the best models have were initially designed for these challenges. Uh, but what we do suggest in the affect recognition, this is CMU Mose data set, uh, actually created in LP's group. This is a reasonably large data set, 25,000 examples, which means that you can supervise, training, fine tuning on this data set, all shouldn't be an issue. It has quite a large set of diverse speakers. It has quite a large set of emotions and a spectrum of sentiments. So happy, extremely happy to extremely negative. So this is a good data set to work on. Um, in terms of media description, again, MS Coco is one of those classic data sets that have existed since forever. Lots of initial methods were proposed on it. Lots of good state of the art ideas have been tested on this. So it's not really a recommendation for your course project, but definitely check it out to see what the field has done. Um, image captioning for multimodal QA, VQA is again, one of those data sets that you wanna look at for reference, uh, but probably not for your research project. Um, we wouldn't stop you if you wanna work on it, but um, there are some new interesting extensions of VQA that are much more interesting. For example, this is a QA data set still under a VQA paradigm, but for social interactions. Yes, you can use pre-trained models, uh, but again, think about the research questions you're gonna ask, right? The, re the pre-trained models can help you initialize your experiments, can be a component, uh, but still the research question should be something interesting that in some sense is almost agnostic to whether you use a pre-trained model or not. Uh, it can also be specific to the pre-trained model, say you want to, specifically test the robustness or be able to distill the knowledge of a you know, big pre-trained multimodal model. But still, the, the research question has to be something that is phrased as we have discussed. It should be something new and falsifiable in both success and failure. You should be able to figure out why. Oh yeah, I'll get to that in oh. the end, yeah. Okay, so social question answering. Um, we all know that AI is pretty good with physical objects things like color, counting, what object it is, they still struggle a bit more with social, like figuring out whether someone is sarcastic, figuring out whether two people are hostile to each other or friendly to each other. 
So social QA is a data set in that direction. Uh, some other examples of multimodal QA, like TV QA with longer videos. Uh, in social QA, social IQ, these videos are just short clips, 30 second and another 30 second clip, another 30 second clip. The good thing about TV QA is that these are pretty long videos and extract the same character across these videos. Right? These are from the TV show Friends. Um, so then you can start doing some interesting dynamics of modeling uh, the personality of these characters across very long durations, for example. So there's TV QA. Uh, there's some very good QA data sets that require more reasoning, right? Instead of just perception, how many blocks are there? But questions like, uh, is it true that there is at least one tower with four blocks with a yellow block at the base and a blue block below the top block? So that's a much harder question. You need to figure out, you need to do counting, you need to do color recognition, you need to understand what is bottom, top, above, below, and so on. So these are synthetic. Uh, but you have lots of data. And this version is a more real world version, so NLVR2, where again you're asking one image shows exactly two brown acorns in back in back to back caps on green foliage. So again, it requires you to understand what is two back to back and and do a lot more reasoning than you typically would for the QA data sets. So these are some interesting data sets to work on. State of the art is still not very good on these data sets. Uh, web QA. So more QA, but targeted for the website. I think these are some news articles or maybe some Wikipedia articles. Uh, so you have text, you also have some captions. And there's also a few data sets that extend it to tables, right? Can you ask questions about tabular information? There's a Wikipedia QA that's also on the list because Wikipedia has lots of tables. And that was QA. Uh, section D was about navigation, right? Now you can instead of just making a prediction at one step, can you take multiple steps of prediction in some navigation task? And there's quite a few data sets built on top of these simulators. I don't know if any of you have looked at houses on Zillow, but you can basically, uh, there is a simulator for these houses and you can step through these houses across multiple steps. Uh, so based on that simulator, uh, lots of AI research has been in coming up with instructions for agents to follow, to navigate in this house. They go to the bathroom and get me my toothpaste and so on. That requires you to do image understanding across pretty long di dimensions, long-term dimensions, and execute these natural language instructions also across very long interactions. So room to room was extended to room across room. This was larger, multilingual with longer paths. Uh, some of these are good, but also be careful that some other data sets require simulators to run, and that may or may not be possible depending on how much resources you have. And a bit more into compositionality. Uh, over here, uh, the winter ground data set was a very nice data set that still stumps a lot of these big pre-trained models nowadays. Can you distinguish some plants surrounding a light bulb, which is typically what you see in your distribution, versus a light bulb surrounding some plants? The models still fail on this type of fine-grained compositional reasoning. Uh, there's been some recent papers, some papers claiming that it's the language understanding that is the issue. Uh, some papers claiming that it's the visual recognition that's the issue. That you're not really able to visualize, like do image processing on where is the plant and where is the light bulb. And some papers which claim that it is the multimodal alignment that is the issue. So it's still open question. Okay. And from affect recognition, at a single step, recognizing person's emotions was extended to multiple steps. So recognizing and tracking people's emotions in dialogue. So this combines section A on effective computing with E, I believe, on dialogue. So can you track the dialogue as the two speakers are communicating with each other in the video? And finally, in section F, this was for video understanding uh, activity recognition, a lot of multimodal data sets based on cooking. And cooking is a very nice example because the instructions are clear and the video, which is you demonstrating the cooking, executing the instructions, <coughs> are perfectly overlapped with the language. So lots of work in egocentric cooking uh, with the hope of being able to actually operate robots or even recognize uh, which step of cooking it is in. Yes. Yeah, I don't know the exact number. It's going to be on Piazza, but I believe... Uh, there's going to be like $50 or $100 credits. And you can probably ask for more, maybe a second or a third time, but um, don't expect unlimited GPUs every week. 
but we'll post instructions on Piazza for getting the uh, things like collab and AWS credits. Okay, and finally, um, section G, section G, some cool examples in retrieval. Um, this IKEA data set is pretty interesting. Um, there's IKEA products in the image space and there's descriptions of them in the language space. So it became retrieve the right product based on these descriptions. So some general advice, um, some of these data sets are gonna use a good amount of resources. Uh, we're gonna give some, and but if you have your personal resources from your research or, or something that would also be good. So if you're starting to process speech and audio and video, that's why we're gonna use more resources than just text and images. Uh, make sure you budget enough time to extract features or start with pre-extracted features or pre-trained models. Uh, but again, these should be agnostic to your research question, right? Whether you pre-extract features or whether you use pre-trained models should only help you answer your research questions faster, but it should not be your entire research question, right? You can't ask a research question like, is a pre-trained model gonna help me on this data set? That's not a research question. Okay, and as mentioned, we're gonna be giving some uh, credits for Google Cloud and AWS. So all the instructions will be up on Piazza. And just a recap, uh, next week, I believe, next week, 5th September, Tuesday, uh, is when you should tell us your project preferences. So over this weekend, look through these slides. Uh, there's this slides with a summary of data sets. There's also a uh, appendix slide that I put on Piazza that really goes into like 50 data sets in detail we've collected over the years. So come up with, look at these resources, come up with a good idea of which task you wanna work on, A through G, and also some ideas for what data sets you wanna work on. Different data sets are gonna address different research questions, different research challenges. So make sure you understand each data set in detail. Um, next week, we're also gonna reserve some time on Thursday so Tuesday, you fill in the form for project preferences, what data sets, what teammates you already have. And we're going to share it with the class. On Thursday, uh, at the end of lecture, we're going to budget some time for students to mingle and discuss and come up with your, your, your teammates. Our reading assignments also start next week. Uh, lecture highlights also start next week. So reading assignments starts on Monday. There's four papers. It's probably going to be the, the survey paper that covers the broad multimodal topics. Um, so read it by, I think, Wednesday, or choose it by Wednesday, read it by Friday, share your summaries with other students by the following Monday, and ask follow-up questions. For lecture highlights, just two, two things you learn or a couple of questions every 30 minutes during lecture. OK. Any questions so far? I'm going to spend the last about um, 20 minutes talking about previous research projects. But any questions with the syllabus? with the high level multimodal data sets about coming up with research ideas. Any questions so far? Yeah, creating your own data set uh, for the purposes of benchmarking is good, but it's also a bit risky because if you need to scale up data set collection with human annotators and uh, AI, mechanical Turk and so on, that's gonna take some time. Um, but if you have an exceptional reason to believe that it can be done within the, the, the duration of a semester, and that this data set will actually lead to some very interesting research questions being answered, you should talk to me or LP maybe later after class. Usually one thing that you can also do is um, start with a data set that we mentioned or in the list, uh, but maybe for some reason, answering a research question will require additional annotations. For example, if you're studying how noise or robustness adversarial affects navigation, then the navigation data set by itself is not gonna have those noisy or missing modalities, but you can then like you know, modify it using a little bit of annotation or post-processing to get at. So that, that's I probably preferable to kind of collecting a completely new data set from scratch. Any other questions? Okay. Examples of uh, previous projects. Uh, these are projects done for the purposes of this course over the past five, six years. 
So the first project is called Select Additive Learning. Uh, the data set that it used or the research task they were studying was effective computing, specifically understanding sentiment from human spoken language and gestures. And they tested on three data sets, all in the list of data sets for multimodal sentiment analysis. And their main idea was to reduce the effect of confounding factors, right? So let's say this particular gender, or for example, even like wearing glasses. Like for example, this person, or these two people wear glasses, right? The, the man at the top and this, this woman at the bottom left. They both wear glasses, and just by just just by luck or just by coincidence, they both have negative sentiment. And they realized through some error analysis that models actually picked up whether a person was wearing glasses, and directly said, "Oh, people who are wearing glasses are saying things that are negative," uh, because that seemed to be a shortcut. That seemed to be easier than actually recognizing what the person is saying and their tone of voice and their facial expressions and so on. And this is probably not the first time you've seen it, right? Uh, Back when deep learning started, you could do ImageNet classifying images. But for some reason, uh, the, some of these models just looking at the background. Right? It was always sunny that cars were parked. And when it's at night, there were no cars that were parked in the parking lot. So all they had to do, instead of actually looking at the cars, is just to recognize whether there's a blue background, sunny, or dark background at night to figure out whether there were any cars. So again, they, they, this is kind of a more bottom-up approach. They started with some of these models, pre-trained models that people are already trained to recognize sentiments. They did some error analysis and they discovered these confounding factors. So their idea was to, um, yeah, so, so their idea, they, they, the error analysis, they found that small give you positive sentiment, not give you positive sentiment, but uh, there was a confounding factor that wearing glasses was always co-occurring with negative sentiment. So the model learned that. So based on this error, they designed uh, a model that basically is so your existing model does something like this, right? Taking your features, learning a model, getting the outputs. Uh, what well, they, they changed it was taking the input feature, <laughs> learning representations of the person, but also putting the identity of the person. Uh, so which person, like basically a one hot variable for every person in the video. And based on the representation, the embedding of the identity, they added noise to it. So your final representation is G, which is your existing feature. Uh, and ideally, that should be person agnostic, right? What you learn from, from language or gesture should be agnostic to the person. And this red part is the identity of the person that is exactly dependent on the person. And you add noise. You increasingly add noise, epsilon, sample random Gaussian noise, to the identity of the person. So eventually, we do this many, many times in expectation because all this noise is going to be different. It's essentially going to... No, expectation becomes zero, uh, the identity of the person's effect goes away. And all you're learning is this G, which now becomes person independent. And they found that this uh, actually helped you uh, mitigate the effect of identity. So mitigate the effect of these you know, people wearing glasses and their specific identities from predicting something. All right, so this final representation is going to be something independent, that is G, and something that is dependent on the person, that is H which you repeatedly add noise to. Okay, so that was that was their hypothesis and that was their kind of experiment to verify this hypothesis. Okay, another example. Again, multimodal sentiments are uh, similar data sets. And their main idea is to estimate the importance at each word level, right? These are videos where you have lots of words, people being said, uh, aligned with the gestures at those steps and with their spoken audio at those steps. Uh, before this, previous models uh, didn't really do this temporal fusion. They did kind of a holistic language embedding across all words, did their holistic visual embedding and holistic audio embedding. Then they studied fusion afterwards. Uh, this one basically studied um, learning at a more fine grained level. So essentially for every time step, in this case, the video, for every frame in the video, they could decide using something similar to attention how much it contributes to the final prediction. And the hypothesis is that this fine-grained temporal modeling at every single step in the video would help in predicting sentiment. For example, sometimes they're happy, they're actually smiling. You wanted to contribute more to predicting happiness. Uh, otherwise, if you're covering your mouth or if you're not really expressive, emotive in your gestures, don't let that contribute to your prediction. Next question? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, 
read their paper. Uh, I don't remember whether they exactly motivated it from a multimodal perspective. I think they did motivate that these identities were the product of the output of some fusion where you had to look at uh, vision, but also audio to detect the identities. Um, but to answer your question about whether your idea should be multimodal, uh, the idea is ideally yes. You can make arguments. I mean, it's hard to define whether a project is really multimodal or not. Like for example, if you're studying robustness or, or missing modalities, it may be seen as language only robustness or multimodal robustness. You should make some effort to, to um, you should make some effort to come up with a research idea that really addresses some multimodal challenge. So for example, formalizing cross-modal interactions and the ways that modalities interact with each other is very multimodal. That would be a very good problem. And if that, any insights there can be used to on your data sets, that would be perfect. Uh, studying alignment between modalities, that is also very explicitly multimodal. So yeah, you should try to make an effort to make uh, your research idea address uh, a core multimodal problem. And the TAs will work with you on this, right? You come up with an idea, we're gonna, the TAs, instructors will talk to you about it. We'll highlight any things that we think are, or may not be appropriate, okay? Yes, so yeah, the goal of this was to build a model that is able to estimate uh, the importance of each modality at every step in time. And essentially they come up with a model that does uses attention weights, uh, different features at every time step, goes through some embedding, and those embeddings are fused with some attention weights that is either soft or hard attention. I'm not gonna get into the details. So. And the hypothesis is that these attention weights actually represent the contribution of each modality at every time step. And you can then verify this, right? You can base on experiments, there were cases where you could learn the contribution very well, uh, but there were also cases where the model doesn't pick up the contributions at every time step that well. Okay, um, some other one, instruction following. So over here, I think this is one of the first few papers which studied uh, language grounded instruction following or language grounded reinforcement learning. And the goal is to build a model that comprehends natural language instructions and actually is able to execute them through multiple steps in this interactive environment. So they, they, uh, the data set was based on this video game. There was a simulator. And some of these instructions are, for example, go to the smallest red object, go to the green short pillar. And you notice, right? Understanding, you could do this in an image case where everything is fully observable. There's a bunch of pillars, go to the shortest one that's also red in color. That's the image face version. But the challenge here is that uh, this missing information. You don't see the entire scene at the beginning. So you have to move around, wait until you see all the pillars before you choose which one to go to. So again, solution uh, was a gated attention and they hypothesized that this gated attention learns to ground uh, what you see in the image, different objects in the image environment with what is mentioned in the, in the description. Uh, learn these grounded representations which can then be used to learn a policy to actually navigate to your what your instruction wants you to. Okay. Adversarial attacks, testing the robustness of EQA models to adversarial attacks. Um, they found that images with a small addition of imperceptible inputs with the same question, you could give it to a pre-trained VQA model that changes the answer significantly. And if you know what uh, people typically do to get these adversarial masks. Essentially, you're taking, previously it was an image only, image classification. You take the image, you, and if you have a pre-trained model, you're gonna to try to penalize the model, make it as far away as possible from what you're actually predicting correctly, while making sure that a change to the image is very small. So in this case, they're a multimodal model. You take in both the image and the question and learn the smallest adjustable smallest adjustment to the image to make the answer change as much as possible. So even the way of generating these adversarial attacks is gonna be conditioned on both the image and the question. Uh, trajectory prediction, this was more self-driving car. Can you take into account uh, the context, right? Not just predict each agent, not, not just treating each car or each pedestrian as a single agent problem, but taking into account all the other agents as a multi-agent problem. 
essentially predicting what the other cars will drive or how the other pedestrians would walk as you are planning what your self-driving car is going to do. This is multimodal or multi-agent trajectory forecasting. The hypothesis is that both uh, multi-agent interactions and agent scene interactions are important. So they design models that actually take, in, take into account multiple agents and, and the, the background scene. Okay, and there's more project examples. There's more project examples on the website. Probably gonna update it later today with uh, more recent examples. But yes, any example, any questions? Any questions about uh, some of these examples? Any other questions about the expectations for the course projects? Yeah, cool. If not, um, that's all for the lecture. I'll stay around a bit more in case people have more questions. Like if you wanted to ask about um, collecting your own data sets, we can discuss it in more detail, but otherwise, thanks everyone.